let's begin our very first conversation, everyone. He looks like yesterday, isn't it? In about 50 days from today, President Muhammad Buhari will be wrapping up. In fact, he will be exiting, not wrapping up. But now he's wrapping up and preparing to exit himself and his members of cabinet and members of his team on a second term, which will be made an eight-year uh, uh, journey in office. There has been a lot of debate on the promises made by the president during his campaign and his overall performance in office. Tonight, my guest is the media advisor to President Muhammad Buhari, Mr. Femi Adishino. He will be shedding light on the administration's accomplishments and challenges. We will be discussing the progress made in key areas such as the economy, security, infrastructure, and corruption, as well as the challenges faced and the lessons learned. Thank you so much, Mr. Deshina. It's good to see you and a happy Easter to you. Thank you. Same to you. I'd like to ask, is President Buhari already preparing to exit? Is he preparing his, his final exit notes? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know that he has set up his uh, transition council, which has been inaugurated and which is working. Uh, so nothing best show the fact that he is ready to exit than the setting up of that transition council. What more do we know practically that is going on as far as uh, the preparations for President Buhari uh, leaving office after a two-term in office? Well, at uh, every, every opportunity he had, he had always said it. He even still said it last week that when he finishes May 29, he will not stay in Abuja. He will not stay in Kaduna, which is near to Abuja. He will stay in Dara, which is very far away, so that... Uh, people who want to come and trouble him with political issues will think twice before they embark on that journey. Uh, he, he said he wants his peace after May 29, and so he will just stay in Dara, at least for the larger part of his requirement. So that, that shows that the president is virtually done and is ready to leave. So how then is he... Uh, I, I mean, uh, you are his mouthpiece, but basically, uh, anything that we are hearing from you now is as though we are hearing from President Muhammad Buhari himself. Uh, you've done this for eight years. Give us an understanding of how the president envisioned his exit from office. Uh, don't forget that he was one president that was ushered in so cheerfully by those of his supporters who thought that Nigerians, Nigeria under him would be El Dorado. Well, uh, your, 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 your question implies that uh, the expectations were largely unmet, but I wouldn't agree with you. He was ushered in cheerfully. He will still be ushered that, that, out. That's cheerfully. what you infer. That's, yeah. that's what you have inferred from my question. Yes. If I'm going to ask you, you know me, Mr. Adeshina, I will ask pointedly and directly. Yes. And we will get to that point just very soon. But okay. I'm asking, how does it, because if for, for as human beings, there are ways and manner in which we hope and we, un, I mean, we, we feel that things should go when we are doing some things. Um, exiting office is going to be another milestone in his life as a leader. And I'm asking, basically, because looking back eight years ago, he, he, he had these huge expectations on him. Now, living in office, leaving the office, how does he think that it will go ceremoniously? How does he envision it? Has he discussed that with you? Oh, yes, uh, we, we, keep, we keep discussing these things, and uh, I know his mind on, on this. Mr. President feels he has done his level best for the country. There's nobody who does everything perfectly, but he has done his best, and uh, he's handing over peacefully, and he will go out cheerfully. Okay, so l let me um, begin uh, in looking in more details on, uh, because what I, was, uh, uh, what I wanted to hear from the question I asked in that regard, I wanted to know, I mean, sometimes you want a white wedding, sometimes you don't want a reception, sometimes you want a quiet one, sometimes you want a loud one, 
I mean, I just wanted to know the manner in which he wanted that exit. It, it, it's implied. not in his hands. It's not in the hands of any exiting president. There are protocols for these things, and the protocols are followed. So it's not in his hands. As long as he has set up that transition council, it's not within his hands again. And they have protocols. Protocols must be followed. When President Jonathan was exiting, the protocols were followed. President Buhari came in. Now that he is also leaving, the protocols will be followed. So it's not strictly well, what is the, the hands of an That's what we want to know. The protocol. What, what is this protocol? The, the protocol is that on May 29, you are at the Eagle Square, and uh, there are already laid out programs which you follow, and you hand over to your successor. And after that, you begin your uh, life in retirement. How that program is carried out is not subject to you. There is a transition council which will even likely be in charge of that program. So you can't say, I don't want this, I don't want it this way, I want it this way. No, it's protocols. There are ceremonials which are not subject to being tampered with. So those ceremonials will be complied with. So let, let's look at the last eight years. What would you say, because you have looked at him closely, you have worked with him closely, and you have seen his, uh, his lows and his highs. What, at what point would you describe as the lowest of this president in his eight-year journey? Well, each, each time, each time is the president hears of killings and abductions, I know how deeply those things affect him. Abduction of pupils, abduction of girls, killing, wanton killings and all that. I know how those things touch him. Those must account for some of the lowest points in his administration. So what would you describe, if those are his lowest, what would you describe as uh, his highest point? No, you know, in the life of a country, there will be many high points. Anytime he, he hears news of people being upright, people following integrity, people doing what he expects them to do, I know how he, he vibrates towards those things. You know, it stands for probity, integrity, and accountability. So anytime that he, he hears news of any of his appointees or anybody in government doing those things, I know he, he particularly likes it. Is the period in which he was very sick, um, does the president think that uh, that was a setback for his administration? It should be, because... He lost how many months? He fell sick January 2017. He came back March, went again in April, and didn't come back till August, I think August 19. So about all, eight months. That sickness took eight months of his time in office. Uh, of, of course, uh, nobody would like that. But uh, what we are glad about is that he came whole. He came sound. He came better than he went. There is one of the uh, 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 critics of uh, the president, of course, uh, Bishop Kuka, in his Easter message. This is what he said. And he has also recognized that uh, the presidency and President Muhammad Buhari also recognized that he's being a, a very critical observer of the of the time of the president in office. This is what he said about the president. Let me uh, allow you to respond to this quickly, Mr. Adishino. And so he says, as you prepare to return to Dara or Kaduna, I do not know if you feel fulfilled or that you met the tall dreams and goals you set for yourself, such as ending banditry, defeating corruption, bringing back our girls, belonging to everybody and belonging to nobody, selling off our presidential fleet and traveling with, uh, with us ETC. Yeah, yes, I think uh, Bishop Kuka cooks very bad meals and uh, they, they are not appetizing at all. 
Somebody has said it's even better that he puts off his castle and becomes a full-time politician. He's rather too partisan. If you look at those things one by one, if you can, if you can display them one again, we can take them one by one. Those things don't do credit to Father Kuka's intellectual posture. He is somebody that we had always admired for his intellectual bent, but his opinions have been colored by politics. He, he talked about selling presidential fleet. Was that ever promised? Was that ever promised? You know that in 2015, there were a rash of promises made that even the candidate then did not know about. So how can you start claiming that he promised that? Can he prove anywhere where the president... Okay, one by one, see, the goals you set for yourself, such as ending banditry. Now the question is, are we where we were on the issue of banditry? Are we where we were in 2015? The job is not fully done, but are we where we were? If Father Kuka is true to himself and true to his calling as a cleric, he will know that this country is not where it was in terms of banditry as of 2015. Defeating corruption. Which country ever defeats corruption? Which country ever defeats corruption? Even China, where they execute corrupt people, the fact that they keep executing shows you that corruption is not defeated. No country defeats corruption. You can curb it, you can minimize it, but he used the word defeating corruption. I think uh, Father, Father Kuka is rather disappointing in, that, in those choice of words. Then bringing, bringing back our girls. How many of those girls were taken away in 2014? And how many have been recovered? He should even be thanked, he should even praise the, the government for recovering a large number of those girls. He can, were the girls even spirited away under President Buhari? No, but the girls are Nigerians and the president did his level best bringing more than a hundred of those girls back. And then belonging to everybody and belonging to nobody. So who does he say the president belong to now? He needs to make that clear. Selling off our presidential fleet, I, I addressed that earlier. Let him prove that the president made that promise. So let's take it from one after the other. So belonging to uh, everyone and uh, belonging to no one uh, statement. But there are a lot of the critics of this government that said this is one of uh, the most nepotistic government uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, appointment and all that that Nigeria has had in, in recent time. How do you defend that? No, 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 no need to defend what you say critics have said. Critics will always be there. And they will criticize because there's their job, there's a pastime. But what are the facts? What are the, the facts? The fact, if you are you disputing, see, for in, example, in, what in, someone like Bishop Kuka has said, so what are the facts that the, this government the, was the in thing about the, in the his thing, appointment and in, in his view of uh, 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 allowing Nigerians to participate in the scheme of things? The thing about critics is that they hear themselves. They hear themselves only. They don't hear alternative, alternate voices. In 2018 or 2019, we came out with a checklist of all appointments made under President Buhari nationwide. And do you know the state that had the highest? Ogun State. I think the second highest state is maybe Imo State. Katsina, where the president comes from, is in number five or six. We came out with that checklist. But people like Father Kuka and other critics don't listen to others. They listen to themselves. And nothing else matters to them. So, I mean, people will make easy reference to the appointment of uh, those who are in the security, uh, in the, the, some of the service chiefs and the hierarchy, uh, in, in, in the security apparatus, those who had different sectors of, uh, of uh, our security in the country, different agencies, and they will say they have come from a certain region of the country. And this is one major issue that has been drawn and that has been uh, that a lot that characterized the criticism on the nepotism that has been ascribed on this government. Security is something you don't subject to politics. Security is you bring your best foot forward. And 
look at the echelon of our uh, of the heads of security agencies since 2015 would you honestly say they have all been from one part of the country who was the chief of naval staff in the first uh, term of this administration was it not a man from cross river state who was the inspector general of police at that time it was it not a man from edo state solomon arase so Security is something that you do based on the best, the best and the brightest, because all you want is for your country to be secure. The president usually says, unless you have secured a country or even an organization, you cannot efficiently manage it. So you get the best that can help you secure a country. That's the thing about security. People who begin to subject the headship of security agencies to where does it come from? They don't know what security is all about. So, okay, now let, let's let's look at it. If you say you look at uh, about ten security agencies in this country, and uh, almost almost seven out of that are being headed by people from one region of the country, are you saying there are no capacity in other parts of the country? Just only one region of the country that has capacity. This is the argument and the. The bait by you, you, those you who have back, criticized this government. You are, you are back mean, to what I've just said. You probably will need. You are back to what I've just said. Don't subject security to ethnic balancing. Don't subject security to federal character. In fact, the constitution that prescribes federal character even gives the president some prerogatives that he can he can appoint on his own. What the Constitution requires of you is balancing in terms of each state being represented in terms of certain positions. Those, most of those positions are prescribed. Security is not part of it. A president will always have the prerogative to appoint those he feels can help him secure the country and have the kind of country he desires to have. Now, let me, let me go, uh, that security area, let me, let me bring something to your mind, Mr. Adishinam. Between 29th of May 2015 and 29th May 2022, 55,430 people were killed by terrorist groups and criminal gangs operating across the country. In 2021 alone, 3.2 million Nigerians had been displaced from their homes. These are surveys done by a security agency. Now. Uh, in the security area, the president has been criticized for failing to adequately address the security challenges facing Nigeria as one of the main uh, pivots of uh, the promises that he made when he was getting into office, particularly the issue of the Boko Haram insurgency in the Northeast region and the rising cases of banditry. In fact, when the president got into office, Things that got worse was issue of banditry, kidnapping, and farmer elder clashes in other parts of the country. It's just about 50 days to his exit in office. Would you say to Nigerians tonight that he's being able to meet his promises and the number of deaths that we have incurred, or I mean experienced in the last eight, eight years was something that Nigerians could easily pardon for a leader who promised to deal with insecurity? Do you have quoted those figures. Do you also know of a report which says that in the past 10 or about 12 years in Nigeria, that 2002, 2022 rather, last year, was the year that recorded the least number of deaths in terms of insurgency and insecurity? Are you aware of that report? You are not quoting that report. Because... It doesn't serve your purpose. What serves your purpose is the negative one. But we know that in this country, the figure has been coming down progressively over the years. And it's a fact of history. Nobody can change it. It's interesting that you know my purpose, Mr. Adeshino, but you have gotten it so wrong. <laughs> that is not my purpose. I'm really now the lives of people that have been lost. These are not trees. These are not firewood. These are real human beings, Nigerians, who have legitimate right under the Constitution to live their lives, but their lives have been cut short. 
you are to explain to Nigerians because your government promised that you are going to deliver. My purpose as a journalist tonight is to ask those questions to allow you to explain to Nigerians whether or not your government has been able to meet up the expectations of Nigerians or you are failing your duty. You will need to help you to tell Nigerians whether or not there are successes and there are failures. Tonight, what do you tell Nigerians, Mr. Additional? Well, when you say your duty as a journalist is what you have explained, you also forget that you are talking to a journalist. And as a journalist, I know A former that... one. A former one. A <laughs> former journalist. You, you are an advisor to a government. You, you can't refer to yourself as a journalist. So what do I Excuse do in that me, government? Mr. Media. You what work for a government. government. You Media speak work. like one. Please go ahead. I wait for the next 50 days, and you will see where you will see me. You will know that this man <laughs> remains... <laughs> you know that this man remains a journalist. Now, when you consider lives that have been lost, no life, ideally, should be lost, not a single one. One life lost is too many. Not one life should be lost. But then, when reports tell you that between 2015 and 2021, so so number of lives were lost. And in 2022, the lowest figure came up. It calls, it calls for something positive. You don't ignore it. You don't ignore it. You have to take the whole, whole thing together. Not just take what you, you want to highlight and leave the positive. No. I mean, I would have loved to go deeper and deeper because this, I mean, it's, emo it's an emotional one for a lot of people. Some of them who are their family members kidnapped and killed. But the question I'm asking you tonight is to tell Nigerians the money that was, has been invested in the last eight years, the effort has been made vis-a-vis -vis the promises that have been made. Nobody is taking you up on what you did not say you will do. We're taking you up on what you promised Nigerians that you will do. And this, you're exiting office. Well, you need to be accountable to Nigerians that you are leaving Nigerians better than you left it. Have you? Far better, far better. And I said it at the beginning, in 2015, we knew where Nigeria was. Minimum of 17 local governments in this country were under the control of insurgents. Talking of control, I mean, they were sitting in Emma's palaces. They were sitting in the uh, seat of the local government chairman. NYSC could not do orientation. They could not even post people to those places. Is that what happens today? No, the Emma's are back in their palaces. Local government chairmen are back in their offices. Orient NYC orientation is happening in those states. And coppers are being posted to those states. Are you now telling me that there has been no improvement? No, no, let's, uh, let, 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 let's, be, let's be factual. As they say, let's give the government, let's cut the government some slack. Ah, please. Uh, I mean, I, I love to touch on a lot of places, but if you dwell on the security areas and the fact that we have, only that you just want an alternative uh, fa uh, figures, but these are official figures I've read out to you. But Mr. Adesina, you touch on, because when you're making reference to Bishop Kuka, you made reference to uh, when he talked about the presidential fleet. Your colleague, Mr. Garba Show, this is what he said. In 2016, he says that... Uh, the, 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 the Mr. Adish, uh, Mr. Garbashe who said, when the president campaigned to be president, the then APC candidate Muhammad Buhari, if you recall, promised to look at the presidential air fleet with a view to cutting down on waste. His directive to a government committee on this assignment is that he like to see a compact and reliable aircraft for the safe airlift of the president, the vice president, and other government officials that go on special mission, this exercise is by no means complete. And look at what we are experiencing. Under the Buhari regime, the presidential air fleet has so far cost taxpayer a total of over 40 billion naira, contrary to the promise that had been made before 2015 that there will be a cut in cost. So when Bishop Huka made that mention, you dismissed it, but these yes. are the facts. These and are I the words of your colleague Galba on this matter. That statement you read out does not in any way come to mind what I have said. He said the president promised to look at the fleet. Where was the promise to sell off all the planes? 
Was that was it in that statement? What Nigeria? Your party had said. Wait, Mr. Adishina, your yes, party you has said. Your let me dwell into that. We might dig deeper. Just for a moment, no, let me not, let me put no, it in perspective. You your party has criticized the past government before you got into office. Uh, this was before 2015, before you got into office, and your party made a promise. In fact, I had interviews on this matter when you said that the presidential fleet was too much, and you guys were going to cut down in, uh, on it, on it. So the question is that, that are statement you keeping you up just to that made. promise? Yeah, I, sure you let me talk. When you talk, I don't interrupt you. That statement... Go ahead, you, please. Go that, <laughs> that statement you read said President Buhari promised to look at the presidential fleet, which he did. Helicopters were given to the Air Force. I think two or three jets were sold off. That is looking at it and cutting off excesses. What some people expect is for the president to sell off all the jets and then he starts flying Nigeria Airways, if Nigeria Airways still exists. We know that British leaders don't fly private jets, they, they fly uh, the British Airways and all that. There are countries like that. If that is what you want for your country, no problem. President Buhari is not the profligate type. If what the country has decided is that the president must travel in commercial flights, he will gladly do. But the promise was, we will look at the fleet. And it was looked at. I know of two or three helicopters that were given to the Air Force. I know of about two jets that were sold. So, was that promise not kept? We will look at it. And it was done. Mr. Adeshina, let's, I mean, because we're out of time now, but you, when you said that you are leaving Nigeria, Nigeria better than you left it. So in terms of the economy, because a lot of people will not forgive me if I don't touch on the issue of the economy. And so I'd like you to put it in perspective what you mean by this. Because the government has also been criticized by economists to say that uh, it has handled the economy badly, particularly the issue of the high rate of inflation, unemployment rate, and the slow economic growth. Mr. Adesino, the figures before your government got into office, perhaps if I remind you, before you got into office, inflation rate is about 9%. It's way over 20% right now. Unemployment rate, 8.19%. It's over 33% right now. That profile in the country was about 12 trillion. You know the figures. So when you say to Nigerians tonight that you are leaving Nigeria better than you left it, would you like to adjust that statement or you stand on that? No, I won't. Because this government made a monoproduct economy. An economy that depended solely on oil. So that any time oil prices fell, oil prices crashed in the international market, Nigeria crashes with it. But today is no longer so. Oil contri co contributes less than 10% of our GDP today. Oil that used to contribute about 90%. For the first time in our history, Nigeria has a diversified economy. Diversification had long been a promise. Today it is no longer a promise. It is reality. It is reality. Oil contributes less than 10% to the GDP of this country today. I think people must credit the Buhari administration for that. Because you now have a Greek, you now have ICT, you now have manufacturing to an extent. You have so many things contributing to Nigeria's GDP, apart from oil. To the extent that oil, I say again, contributes less than 10% to our GDP. The economy has been diversified first time in over 60 years. That is something nobody would deny the Buhari administration. Well, indeed. Thank you so much, Mr. Femi Adishina, for your time. Your colleague, uh, Garba Ashew, has said that uh, in a few months' time that Nigerians will miss President Buhari, uh, we hope to see how that pans out. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you.